Well, thank you so much, Pastor Bill. I uh, really appreciate the uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'm uh, really delighted to be here, be here with you in Adelaide. Uh, it was here, uh, ministered here in, uh, in one of your services, yeah, in this service, yeah, in this service, uh, might have been five years ago, uh, I think. So uh, I'm really pleased uh, to be with you again. I'm inspired by Pastor Bill's faithful, consistent, long-term leadership. Um, been senior pastor here, you know, this is 40, year 43? 44 years uh, of consistent leadership. And uh, uh, I planted a church in England uh, in what, February 2014. And uh, I, I would love to still be the senior pastor of that church 44 years after I started. I, I will not be a young man should that come to pass. But, um, but I pray God that it might. Uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be with you. Uh, um, you were telling me how it's, it's set up. I think it's, is it um, Port fans here and Crows fans here? Is that how the church is, is all? Oh, right, right. No, everyone's in together. Oh, well, you'd need the grace of God to pull that off, wouldn't you? Goodness me, goodness me. It's better twice a year. It could get interesting, couldn't it? But um, no, I love, I love the city of Adelaide. I think it's a, it's a beautiful place. So I wanted, this morning I wanted to tell you uh, some of my story. And so I became a Christian when I was 12 years old and uh, it didn't take me too long to work out that the last paragraph in Matthew's Gospel was important. Uh, and so we call it the Great Commission. We, we're doing a series called Church on the Move. And uh, I've, I've looked at the summary of the series. So I know that this, uh, if you were here in church two weeks ago, uh, you would have seen uh, this Bible passage where Jesus explains, he says to uh, his followers, uh, and I, I'm going to tell you what he said to his followers. Of course, I've got this, memorised this passage so many years ago, but... Um, Am I not going to get it? I got it earlier. I got it in the first service. All right, I'm not getting it. I'll read it to you. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on it. There it is. Uh, Jesus came to them and said, all authority. You're just teasing me, you people up the back there. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we call it the Great Commission and, uh, and I've heard it put, uh, Jesus' last command is our first priority. Uh, and so I knew, I knew that, I know that this is an important uh, Bible verse and I did various things uh, in leadership when I was in my 20s uh, and everything like that. But I wanna tell you about what happened to me uh, really when I was, I was age 38. And so I'd uh, born and raised in Sydney, uh, moved to Melbourne, met and married a Melbourne girl and had done some more study and everything and I uh, was working as a barrister in Melbourne. Uh, we had uh, a daughter and I was really quite happy, really quite pleased with how things had turned out. And I wasn't really looking to do anything other than more of what I was doing. Uh, that was the plan, just more of the same. Uh, was I comfortable? You bet I was comfortable. I was really comfortable. Uh, and comfort's got a lot going for it. Have you ever worked that out in life, right? Comfort's pretty good. I like comfortable. I was enjoying comfortable. But God had other ideas. In uh, uh, the early months of 2012, my wife, Catherine, is, uh, she's the early bird in our family. So she was spending a bit of time in prayer one morning and the Lord started speaking to her about a nation in Eastern Europe called Moldova. Moldova is a small country uh, tucked between Ukraine and Romania. Uh, it's a part of the former Soviet Union and it is... Uh, 
since independence, it's had a lot of problems. Uh, there's, there's corruption. Uh, it is the poorest country in Europe. And uh, it's, it's not a holiday destination. Uh, when I talk about Moldova, most people go, Mol, Mol, no, 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 I don't really know it, right? It's, uh, you know, it's not a place that you would go out of your way to get to. Uh, it's only a smallish nation of uh, between two and a half and three million people. So it's not, not, not big either in terms of population, nor size, nor influence, nor fame. Uh, that is the nation of Moldova. But the Lord started speaking to Catherine. She'd, she'd seen some feature on it at a conference she went to uh, a few years prior or something. But that morning in 2012, the Lord started speaking to Catherine about going there, making a difference there, starting some, some charitable ministries there, helping out. Uh, there's a lot of um, sex trafficking uh, has happened. It's a, a prominent uh, source country uh, for uh, young women who are trafficked. And, uh, and the Lord started speaking to Catherine about doing something amazing in that nation. Meanwhile, I am sound asleep. You know, I was talking about comfort earlier. I was, I was comfortably asleep. And Catherine bursts in on me and said, oh, Lord started talking to me, Moldova, oh, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do this, and there's this, and da 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 and, and it was, I, I'm, I'm just like, huh, what, huh, what? I was expecting something lines, along, along the lines of, good morning, sweetheart. Uh, and instead, this is what I'm met with. <laughs> oh, marriage, hey? Any of you married? Yeah, 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 right, marriage, yeah. And so I'm just like, oh, love. And I thought about it. And, and uh, you know, after I'd woken up, I thought about it. And I thought, no, that's <laughs> a daft idea, right? Who do we know over there? No one. Well, do we speak their language? No, right? It, it just... It just made no sense to me. And so I said, love, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's do something else. How about we just keep doing what we're already doing, which is kind of nice. And now I'm fact, in fact, finding it quite comfortable. Why don't we just do that instead? And so we, we then had an interesting few months in early 2012 because uh, her desire to do something there, like she had been bitten by the bargain and, and she was bitten hard. And the Lord continued to speak to her, show her faces of people uh, that, that we've since met in Moldova. Uh, and so, which kind of tells you where I'm headed, doesn't it? And so, uh, so the Lord kept speaking to her and my desire to do something there stayed at zero. And so that made for an interesting couple of months. And, and then, then that sort of brings me to, to the day uh, on which things change, right? And so uh, one day in June 2012, uh, we were in uh, a service, just worshipping uh, and everything, uh, nothing freakishly rare or unusual about it or anything like that, uh, but the second song or something like that in the morning and the Lord speaks to me. I just felt the Holy Spirit give me, and this doesn't happen to me every day, right? I just felt the Holy Spirit give me three short sentences. Move to England, plant a church, and that church will be the base for missions into Moldova. I was like, oh, oh, I don't, and, it, and it, I sort of put two and two together and it occurred to me, if I want to be a comfortable barrister in Melbourne, it's going to be very hard to do that as well as what I've just been told to do, right? Um, that was it. Moved to England, planted church. That church will be the base for missions work into Moldova. And at the time that I felt the Holy Spirit say that to me, Catherine's right next to me, so I, immediately I told her, and her response was, yes, that will work, that will work. And basically, from that moment, 
that was June 2012, it was 13 months, 13 months, and then in July 2013, our plane touched down at Manchester Airport to begin our journey, planting a church in England and, uh, and then using that as a base to do missions work into Moldova. Uh, it was uh, it just an amazing year where it was just so obvious that this was how the Lord was leading us. We had some friends in Melbourne who uh, were going to come with us. It didn't happen for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but they had thought about it and prayed about it and uh, they, one of them had English roots. And so uh, they felt that the Lord was saying that, because you know, England's you know, plenty of places to live in England. I mean, the obvious place to plant a church in England it would be London. Um, if you want to go to next most obvious, you could go, you know, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, there's plenty of big cities uh, that you can choose from. But these friends of ours felt that we're meant to go to a town called Halifax, uh, which is a sort of uh, 80,000 people in Halifax. So that's a sort of a, a Bendigo Ballarat a sized town. Uh, it's in West Yorkshire and uh, Halifax is, is not London, right? It's not, it's not London. It's on a whole different scale to London. But these friends of ours felt that that was the part of England that we were meant to go. And so rather than tell us, which is one option that they had, um, they, they sort of put out a fleece and they said, Lord, if you're in this, you tell John and Catherine separately that that's where we're meant to be. Um, well, I didn't think it was excellent. <laughs> I just would have preferred they told me, right? But that's what they did. But the Lord actually did think it was excellent because he did tell us, right? And so, um, and so uh, one morning, again, I'm just simply trying to get some sleep, right? And the Lord starts speaking to Catherine, tells her to get up and look at the map. So she fires up Google Maps, looks at the map of England and um, zoom in, zoom out, zoom out, go here, go there and everything. And she ends up believing that the Lord was saying that Halifax in West Yorkshire is where we were meant to go. And so uh, I get the same treatment, you know, just come storming into the bedroom, blah, 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 Halifax, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, okay, great, all right. Um, and then uh, I think the next day, we're talking to these friends and Catherine says, I, th I think the Lord's spoken to us about where in England it should be. I think it should be a place called Halifax. And, and then it all comes out. Um, and all four of us are just like, no way, no way. And so from that moment, there's never been any doubt that that is the place that we were meant to go. And so uh, we, uh, you know, we then finally uh, make the journey and uh, start ministering in uh, this town. And we really feel that it's, it's a, a lifetime call. Uh, so we've, uh, we just wanna keep doing it and doing it for as long as we've got breath. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, of course, once we arrive in Halifax, um, you know, get a place to live and everything. And then there was, uh, there's five Pentecostal churches in our town. So we, you know, go and say hi to the leaders of the other churches and everything. And, um, and they're all you know, really good people. There's good uh, relationships between the different churches in our town and everything. And so, you know, we explain to them our story, which is pretty wild. And they're all scratching their heads and going, this hasn't happened before around here. Uh, and they... But of course, when you talk about Moldova, that they respond as, as most people do, Moldova, no, no, I don't know it. Um, uh, except for, for one church uh, whose leader responded with, oh, we sent a team to Moldova last year. And, uh, and they again sent a team to Moldova the following year. And so they had a whole bunch of relationships with Christians in this one particular city in Moldova and everything that we've done in Moldova has come through the relationships that, these, that this other church in our town had. So we, we've no doubt that, that that's where the Lord took us so that we could 
make that connection to make those connections over in Moldova. And, uh, and we've found the right people who we can work with and got all sorts of plans and ideas for uh, the sorts of ministries that we might have there that need a lot of uh, help with uh, you know, rehab, with uh, you know, drug addictions, alcohol addiction, a uh, huge problem uh, there. And there's a lot of openness to the gospel amongst, uh, amongst those sorts of folks. And so, uh, yeah, all sorts of possibilities for where that could head. And we're just so thankful to God that we found the right people to work with over there. So we've, we've now done nine, or might even be 10 trips to Moldova. Uh, so every six months we go. The pandemic was uh, uh, intensely frustrating that we had to put everything on hold for sort of two and a half years. But we're now, just, just um, like three weeks ago, Catherine was back in Moldova for the first time since the pandemic and there's more green lights there and opportunities there and everything. So, uh, and we, we've kept on taking people from our church there because we realise and many people within our congregation are now really getting a heart for the place and really uh, you know, just can't wait for the next missions trip uh, and everything like that. So, uh, so God's uh, using us to do some, some great stuff there. And even within Britain itself, uh, you know, I know that Britain is historically a, a Christian nation. I mean, the, the, the part of Britain in which we live has been officially Christian since the year 627. That would be 1,395 years, right? That was, that was 627 is when the king of Northumbria uh, committed his life to Christ, got baptised. Uh, so it, you would think, wouldn't you think, if a place has been I know officially Christian and actually Christian are, are, are different things, but if, if a place has been officially Christian for 1,395 years, wouldn't you think that some of the folks there might actually know that God loves them? <laughs> Would that have possibly permeated the culture to some extent after 1,395 years? Oh, oh no, no. It is spiritually bleak in a lot of England. And, uh, and as we went along, uh, you know, we had our church in Halifax and then the Lord started speaking to us about, about reproduction, about planting more churches. And, and in particular, because the Lord put us in a town rather than a city, many strong churches in the big cities. If you come to me after the service and say, look, I've got, you know, I've got a you know, friend of a friend who lives in Manchester, not connected with a church, but open, you know, can you give me a recommendation? I'll give you six awesome churches doing great work in Manchester, no problem. If you come to me and say, oh, I've got a friend of a friend who lives in such and such a town, town of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, right? It's gonna be so much harder for me to give you the name of a church that's making disciples, preaching the gospel, making a difference in these places. And so uh, we went 12 k's down the road to a town called Todmorden. And, uh, and when I, uh, we, we felt called to, to plant a daughter church there. And so I was talking to one of the Church of England folks there. And, uh, and I said, okay, how many, how many churches here in Todmorden? And uh, apart from uh, us, the answer was eight. Since, since then, two of them have closed, six. And I say, okay, of the eight churches, how many is in church on Sunday? And she says, mm, uh, 200. In a town of 20,000, 200, 1%. Um, and I said, okay, uh, so there's 25 in each church, right? Um, and... I said, of the 200, how many would be aged under 50? Because I suspected that most of these churches were predominantly elderly folks. And she says, yeah, under 50, maybe 10 to 20 people. 10 to 20. In a town of 20,000. You know, the, the average town in outback China would have more believers 
certainly more non-elderly believers than your average town in the north of England. Even there's, there's a move of God happening in the nation of Iran. The, that's the Islamic Republic of Iran. The average town in Iran would have more Christians than the average town in the north of England. That's where it's at. And you know, one of, the, of all the days that we've had since we've landed in the UK, you know, one of my, my favourite days, one of the best days I've had was when it, we, in this town after we started Todman and uh, we've had uh, a number of baptisms there and we've had uh, a lot of uh, fruit amongst uh, high school students because um, uh, the Lord gave us a really uh, a fantastic guy to be part of our congregation there who's, who's a teacher at the local high school. Uh, and so a lot of, uh, quite a few high school students have come along and some of them have come to Christ and been baptised. And um, I remember the day we did our, our second baptism in Todmorden. And I, it's funny, you know, what we, we got a car and I prayed because um, you don't need a car as much in Britain. Everything's so close together. And we, we went without a car for a season, then we got a car and, and I, I prayed, God, I just pray that you give us a car that's big enough to fit the baptism tank in it. Because um, we've got this portable baptism tank and it's, it's, it's not, not small, right? So that's, that was my prayer. And then got, saw this fantastic offer on a car, got the car, it's too, it, the tank doesn't fit in it. And then, and then, um, the combined churches group who, who owns this tank decided we needed a new one and it comes in more pieces, same size, but in more pieces and all the pieces could fit into the car. Um, I'm just like, oh God, you, you are, you, I love your sense of humour. That is so cool, right? Um, and so this particular evening, I'm driving home from Todmorden and I've got the baptism tank in pieces right, like right behind my head and filling up the rest of the car. And I've got my sermon notes on the floor somewhere and everything like that. And I just stopped and I reflected and I thought, therefore, go. Done that. Make disciples. I'm not doing that. Baptise them in the name of the Father and the Son. And the Son. I'm like, oh, I've been doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Well, yeah, we've been doing that. And I just thought, this is it. This is it. Why would you want to be a barrister in Melbourne when you can do the Great Commission? Like, what can compare? What can compare with the Great Commission? Nothing this world offers can compare with that. Now look, I, this is how the Lord has led me, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that you should go home today and get on eBay and, and buy a baptism tank, right? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he's dreaming. Okay, that's an option. I'm not saying that you need to do that, right? The commission is to us as a group, as a church, right? Um, and so, but we are church on the move and the Lord will call you to play a role, to play a role in fulfilling the Great Commission. And your role will be different to that of the person next to you, different to me, different to whoever, right? The Lord will lead you to play a role. And sometimes you just keep going on your merry way and you'll be, end up doing the right stuff if you're simply growing as a Christian and everything like that. But you, if, you've, if you know the Bible at all, you realise that sometimes God will speak and call directly to people. And my life, my Christian life, a Christian since I was 12, but the day that I got those three sentences, that day is sort of that my whole Christian life could be split in two, before the three sentences, after the three sentences, right? That was the moment that the call of God came to me. And some of you are thinking, 
I'd like that. Because then I'd have clarity as to what I'm meant to do. Some of you are thinking that would be really handy. And I thought that way for a long time. But what I've realised is what really matters is not will God speak to me? The big question is will I obey when He does? That's the big question. Will you obey when He does? Because I wasn't particularly looking for the call of God that came to me. And I read my Bible enough to know that the call of God comes to people in all sorts of different situations. It's got nothing to do with age. In the Bible, there's some incredibly young people who have astonishing missions given to them. The Virgin Mary is a teenager. A teenager gets a personal visit from the angel Gabriel and gets told what her mission is. As a teenager, prophet Jeremiah gets told, you'll be a prophet. And he says, I'm too young. And God says, no, you're not. Go. And he said, and I I love calling Jeremiah. It's one of my favourite scriptures. Because God says to Jeremiah, you're meant to prophesy to these people, those people, those people, and them as well. And I will be with you and I will rescue you. Which begs the question, from what? (laughs) Mm. But at the other end of your demographic spectrum, we've got the 80 year old Moses, who's working in the family shepherding business and simply all the man wanted to do was to have a look at why the bush was burning. That's all he wanted to do. Did he want a mission to confront Pharaoh and then take out three million of the biggest whingers in the history of whinging across the Red Sea? Is that, was that in his plan for his 80th year? Abraham's even older again when the Lord speaks to him about some of the things that he wants him to do. Age has nothing to do with it. What matters is that you will be obedient when the call comes. That's what matters. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what sort of people are, generally are obedient when God speaks. It's the people who are faithful in small things. Those are the ones who are faithful in the bigger things. And we know that this is true because Jesus says it's true, right? Faithful in the little and you'll be faithful in much. If the Holy Spirit leads you to give $10 to a friend of yours who's in need and you're like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna keep my $10, right? If you can't be faithful when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something really small scale, then then it ain't gonna happen. You you never even come to the burning bush. Why, Why would the Lord even put a burning bush in front of you if you say no when he says to do something small. He's not gonna tell you to do something large, is he? Right? It's faithfulness in the small things is what you need to focus on that you one day might hear about a large thing that the Lord wants you to do. And so what I started my story with, uh, you know, Catherine speaks 
hearing from God in 2012 uh, and everything like that. But if you actually go back a few years more, in 2010, uh, I was talking to her and I just realised that you know, my own walk with God was just, just nothing special, which really wasn't particularly close. And I'd had some great moments as a Christian, you know, in my 20s and everything like that, and as a teenager as well, but, but just been... Nothing really much had happened for quite a while and everything. And I, I said to Catherine, it's just, just not really growing, you know, walk with God. I probably I should be, you know, I should be. I'm not, not a young Christian anymore and everything. And she said, you need to fast. And I said, I might get a second opinion. Actually. <laughs> But I knew that she was right. Oh, I wasn't happy about it, right? But I, I knew that she was right. And so uh, I, just, just one meal once a week, just one meal once a week, it's not much. And so I got in the habit, in, during 2010, I got in the habit of Monday lunch times. I'd simply sit in a cafe, get a hot chocolate, I'd will it to turn into a sandwich, but it never would, right? And I just, I just got in the habit of spending some time in prayer and I started showing some faithfulness in something small. And I started growing again. And it was good. It was good. And then it wasn't all that many more months until new opportunities, exciting opportunities came to me. And all of a sudden I was doing this and then I started doing that. Uh, and then in 2012, well, I've told you all about it, right? Faithfulness in the small things will lead to God speaking to you about big things. And when he does, big question is, Will you obey? And you know, what um, oh, it's just been awesome to share with you this morning, um, but what I wanna do is have a chance for, for you uh, to receive prayer if you want to hear from the Lord. Now, he, he can speak in so many different ways on so many different occasions. He can even use your spouse, right? Um, that's how creative God is, um, right? But some of you are faithful. Many of you are faithful and you want to hear from God. And I, I just, I love, and Pastor Bill, I'll get you to come back up or, or Sam, whoever, whoever um, wants to. And, uh, and I just want to give you a chance to say to the Lord, I'm open. I'm open to, to whatever it is. Who knows what he'll call you to do. It might be spectacular. It might not be. It might involve giving $10 to the person three rows behind you. I don't know what the Lord might call you to do. But many of you are open. So let's pray that the Lord will speak to those of you who are.